interesting talk. Today we're going to have a conversation with, with John Byners. He is, um, let me show you, he's Policy and Communication Officer for the Environmental Protection in Scotland. And he has worked with the Herald, Sunday Herald, the Mail on Sunday, the Sun and the London Evening Standard, Standard among other national titles during 27 years of career in the UK journalism before he joined Environmental Protection Scotland in 2018. He raises media awareness and knowledge of efforts to improve air quality that includes the promotion of Clean Air Day, the UK's national air quality campaign, which EPS has coordinated on behalf of the Scottish government since 2018, noise issues, land quality, and ever emerging environmental issues. So thank you very much, um, John, for being with us. And thank you very much for the time that you are going to share uh, with the Breedable Cities community of practice again. And um, we, we have already prepared some of the questions, but we want to start by giving you the chance to introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with the youth, and then we can start the conversation from there. Uh, yes, well, we've, um, you know, as you say, I've got a background um, that wasn't anything to do with air quality. Um, and, you know, I came to air quality and in environment quite late in my life. I had a whole career as a journalist and before me, and it was a big change in my life because, uh, you know, before I was sitting in a desk uh, writing stories for the media, for websites, for, for newspapers, and I wasn't actually always getting out to, to meet people. And <clears throat> this job was fantastic because I actually got out to meet people and I got out to schools. I got out to give presentations like this. But in those days, we didn't have um, Zoom. We were just everybody had conferences. We went to conferences and gave speeches. And um, we organized, uh, we got the contract from the Scottish government to organize Clean Air Day in 2018. Um, and our first Clean Air Day took place in June 2018. Uh, so we, The whole point of Clean Air Day was to try and get young people and, and older people, everyone really, but it was mainly targeting younger people, to be honest, because that's where this feedback came from and, and the support came from the schools um, to improve air quality, to cut um, vehicle emissions, uh, to cut the number of vehicles on our roads, you know, to prevent people, to stop people making the short journeys to work and to school, um, to the shops when they could use bicycle, they could use active travel, they could walk. They could cycle, they could scoot. Um, so, yeah, this has been a really amazing campaign to be involved in. And uh, we started off very small because it was a, with any campaign, you start off re really small. You know, you don't just have a big campaign from day one um, and things need to be built up gradually over every year. So we had um, a lot of support from politicians, um, you know, SNP, Labour, conservative different parties it doesn't matter what political party you're from air quality is it, it goes across all boundaries doesn't it i mean uh, so we uh, got involved in doing a big event um in glasgow you know I, i know a lot of you probably focused on glasgow this year with the cop 26 climate change summit next next month uh, but yeah glasgow is an amazing city and it's where our office is based um and there's an amazing square right in the center of glasgow which we got sealed off to cars, to no cars allowed. Normally it's busy with cars and lorries and taxis. And uh, we had this event on Clean Air Day where people could come and learn about e-bikes. They could come and have a, young people, children could come and learn about cycling, cycle training, how to cycle. Um, there was information about air quality. Uh, people had laptops uh, with information about air quality, about railways and how to get around using active travel. So we had like, really good attendance at this considering it was the first event and uh we had politicians along we had a, a bmx track in the middle of the square where young people could come and try a bmx and some of the older people as well but were trying that so this is a big big event and then we had something the same year in edinburgh where they closed off the streets again edinburgh very car dominated city you know you you know it princess street the castle Anybody that's been to Edinburgh will know that you're always walking near cars and vehicles. And it's a very old, old city and it doesn't really like all these cars. <laughs> so Edinburgh wanted to do something to encourage 
cycling and walking and active travel. Um, and they closed off the city centre streets. And we had about 9,900 pupils from a school in Edinburgh called Sheen Primary. Uh, and their pupils are really switched on to air quality and they marched down the uh, from the castle near the castle down to the uh, where the main railway station, the park is in the city centre of Edinburgh. And there was no traffic on the roads and they had banners which said, we want better air quality. And they were singing songs. Um, and then they had they got to the end and they did a big march and we had a speeches uh, and there was yoga and things like that. So people could make use of the car uh, where the cars were mm -hmm. and to improve air quality and, and health and well-being as well. So so we were very much involved in this and this is a big success. We've done it every year since. Um, and we have got more and more schools involved. We've got like, quite a few, I'd say a couple of hundred schools have taken part. Uh, 200 schools have taken part over the last few years uh, for EPS. And it's just got bigger and bigger and, and young people want to know about it. They want to learn about air quality and they want to learn about how to improve the environment in their school, part of their education. So what, uh, we yeah. built up contacts and it was fantastic. It's been a fantastic experience. What, what do you think makes um, interested, uh, the youth interested into these um, situations, into air quality? Uh, what is this, the way to approach the youth and to have them interested in these topics? Um, yes, because yeah, I mean, do you, yeah. sorry, because you have this experience in journalism mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a very interesting experience uh, talking about how to communicate and how to engage people into stories. So how, what do you think it's the, the best way to make people, young people and children interested into these matters? Well, I think it's really important if you're approaching a school um, or a college uh, to have a, a teacher, to get to know a teacher or, or um, a head teacher um, or a lecturer, uh, just somebody that's interested, got an interest in this. If you've got somebody that can take on the responsibility for um this that that's a huge support but primarily it's about building relationships and and making people feel appreciated um that what they're doing not in a financial sense but um that you appreciate what they're trying to achieve to raise awareness of air quality and, and to educate young people and to educate their parents as well because they're taking these messages home to their parents about driving and cars and, and cycling so really good to sort of Make them feel you know that you you really appreciate that they get involved and you know social media is a huge part in that because you can tweet about them and you can tweet photographs they've sent you or they can tweet and you can like and retweet and uh, so social media is a huge important part of that but primarily i think you need to you know really have a, an awareness of the amount of work that goes into this kind of um school curriculum activity and just be grateful for the fact they're doing that and just keep in touch with them and, and build, build long-term relationships um, because don't just forget about somebody after you've finished with them for one campaign and, and just keep in touch with them until the next one and, and keep them interested and excited. So we, we're always trying to thank people on social media and we tag the, the schools that get involved and we use their pictures and we include them in, a, in our report. We do a big report at the end of the year and we We really praise them for what they've done because it's absolutely amazing. You know, there's kids that just um, they what they take they take responsibility for you know the actions of other people and um, children are amazing these days and young people. But it needs somebody in the school to really um, be involved and be excited about this as well. So building a good relationship with someone's important. Um, you, when you're talking about your your experience, the experience that you've had in schools, how how did you take the science to schools and and how did, did you make a part of their learning experiences considering um well i don't know if you know about the situations in latin america and asia but sometimes the schools are overworked they have very limited resources but they have very rigid syllabi and, and very rigid educational systems so How do you suggest we can tweak that a little bit and introduce these kind of topics and how we can bring down the science to the kids? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'd, I'd be surprised. I think young people are really knowledgeable and intelligent about science for a start. They're interested. Something that you want to learn about when you're young, isn't it? Anybody that's that age. I'm, I'm not interested in science now, but when I was younger, it's really fascinating. Uh, so don't make it too technical. Um, I would say just, just look around you. You know, you've got your playgrounds, you've got forests nearby, you've got trees, you've got a woodland area in some schools. 
Um, and if you live in an urban area, like in the center of a big city in South America, you've still got a playground um, and you've got roads nearby. So you can do, these are fantastic opportunities. You can do very simple things such as um, going outside and doing a traffic count. The school, children can count how many cars pass their school at the busiest time when they're dropping off pupils or at the end of the day or at lunchtime. Um, take that traffic count back and have a discussion with the teacher um, and find out you know, why that is. Are people using cars too much? Could they cycle more? Have a discussion, start kickstarting those, those topics. Um, I mean, there's things like air pollution studies. Um, you can easily go and take some samples of, of your trees or bark to try and impact, find out the impact that air pollution is having on a, on a tree, for example, or taking samples of um, plants, for example. And that's something that's been done in Edinburgh as well with some of the schools. There's a, a beautiful uh, meadow in Edinburgh. Um, it's just massive in the middle of Edinburgh. It's beautiful, um, which you wouldn't think of in, a, in such a big city, but the children from this school I was talking about, they went out there and did samples and took, um, uh, you know, plant samples and they did experiments and they came back and they learned more about air pollution and how it was affecting that, you know. So I think you have to be creative, but not get too technical. But there is opportunities to be technical if you want to be when they're older, uh, but just get them interested in it. And then they can draw about their experiences as well of travel. You know, younger pupils, younger children can you know, ask them to do a picture about what air pollution represents to them, what it means to them, and what they think the ideal world should look like. You know, we don't have lots of cars in our cities, and, uh, you know, should, is a bicycle representative, an electric vehicle, you know, somebody walking or being in nature? All these things are, are creative, and, and they don't cost anything either, just time and commitment and passion. Yes, actually, time is sometimes very, uh, it's sometimes a challenge in schools, uh, especially when we're talking about mm, the, the state run schools uh, in countries like Mexico and India and, and yeah. many other places around the world. But I understand that what your suggestion is that we can create experiences for children to reconnect with their environment and not just within the four walls of the classroom, right? To go out, yeah. oh, look out the window and observe get at outside. least yeah, yeah get, get outside out. get outside and if if there is funding for air quality monitoring but i don't know whether there is all the time but that's an opportunity to, to have some air quality portable air quality monitors are becoming more common um, and cheaper as well and, and if you have a company that makes these machines an air quality monitoring company they might lend you um, some air quality monitoring equipment to to tie to a lamp post or a tree so you can measure the air quality It's really good citizen science. You know, that, that's really interesting. Uh, and they get something out of it as well, the companies. So, again, just try and do what you can with the resources, but you don't need to be, you can be in the middle of a city centre with a small playground and you can still do something. How did you come up with the design of these programmes? Um, uh, talking about, uh, I mean, did you experiment with the children and then design the experiences? Did you had to bring a, a, a team of experts in education. How, how was the program that you use created? I mean, as an example of how, what steps can we follow to create our own programs in our own cities? Yeah, well, we've got, um, we work with, I'll, I'll try and see if I can do a share screen quickly. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, you know, they talk, it's... Um, right, I just uh, I don't know if I can share share anything at all, but uh, uh, I'll try and do this. I don't know if you can see that at all. Yes, we can. Yeah, see this, it. yeah, we work with um, a company you'll see in the top left hand corner called Global Action Plan, and they are a charity that um, organises clean air day across the UK, um, and we work with them on developing toolkits. Um, You know, so we have workplace for the workplace, but we also have school toolkits um, and people can download things like no idling leaflets or clean air jade travel choices at work. You put in your name and details and your company and it's free. You download it, but they just have a, a register of your name. So it's great. You can keep in touch. And um, many of these things are like posters for schools. I'll see if I can find some more, actually. Uh, uh,
Yeah, it's like you can download leaflets, you can download posters for your school wall. Um, there's coloring. I mean, it's a lot of work goes into something like this. But if you have an organization that's interested in it, then uh, it's quite good. So let's see if I can find that. We have pledge cards as well, which are pretty amazing. Um, but these, these can be done yourself, things like this. I don't know if you can still see it. Uh, we see the page, oh, yeah. the Global Action Plan page. Yeah, okay. I'll just try and stop sharing. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, things like this, a pledge card. I don't know if you can see that at all. Can you see that now? Yes, we can see that now. Yeah, pledge cards where you, you put your logo on it. These are free. These, these don't cost anything, and you put a message on it, um, such as go polluting vehicle free, um, give the car a day off, um, avoid non-essential polluting deliveries, and make a statement on air pollution. And what we do is we get children to print, we get schools to print these card pledge cards off and the children hold them up and then they post it on social media uh, with the various tags we need, like air quality hashtag. Uh, and they don't cost anything, but we, we're lucky we work with a, a bigger charity to design toolkits, which uh, are targeted at schools. Then we get feedback every year on how, they, how they've been successful or not. Um, and from there, we either maybe change it, we improve it every year. So. We're kind of lucky in that respect, but you can still do things like pledge cards. It doesn't cost anything. So do you, what you do is a little bit like uh, giving the children the opportunity to be kind of little activists. And, and, yeah, and, that's and, right. <laughs> that sounds yeah, and great. Have so, they, they do color it. We give them coloring competitions like a clean air. There's a thing called a clean air day superhero. And it's like you have to design, for younger children, have to design a clean air day superhero, what he looks like, what she looks like. And that's amazing too. So... Um, there's something for all the ages and we go up to the older pupils and older students um, and there's more complicated questions like a questionnaire um, and traffic counts and things like that. So there are a lot of different things in there. Is there any, any impact? What is the impact that children have had um, in, in your city about, uh, well, I mean, have they created something on their own? Like, uh, has it become something that they have uh, a, engaged with and created something to continue the campaign something that has gone beyond the campaign yeah it's um well we, they've done uh they did they were asked to design um posters uh well they designed uh clean air day um images of air quality you know what what it represents the air pollution and obviously we came up uh, schools did this and then what happened was they turned these um CEPA, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, had some funding from the Scottish government and they turned these into banners. Um, so their artwork appeared outside schools, their own school, um, and it's message with messages like, leave the car at home, cycle, not take the car. And this is pretty amazing. It's really colourful and uh, it's, it gives them something. They can actually see what, what they're doing is making a difference. Uh, so there's a huge big banner that goes outside their school next to the gates where people drive and it's got their picture and it's absolutely amazing. So the, they had that competition. And then another competition this year was uh, to, um, they did some artwork, a school in Glasgow did some artwork, beautiful artwork. And they got the council there, beamed it onto the side of one of the main buildings in Glasgow, the concert hall. Uh, and it looked really fantastic. So it was at night and it was just all lit up with lights. It was fantastic. So the children get back, they see that and they think, oh, that's amazing. I want to take part in that. Yeah, that sounds that sounds fun, and that sounds very um, interesting. How children can go beyond the, the the program, the basic program that you can organize, um, and then they start creating their own actions for their own communities. Yeah. Um, for for it makes me think because in in diff, in countries like ours, um, sometimes the schools are, are as I said before, they are overworked. They don't have resources. And also there is a situation that is not, it is not easy to, to take out children from, from the school uh, premises because of security and because of different um, situations that we live in our countries. Um, so you were talking about social media. It is not easy to use social media for children under 13 legally. Um, How would you suggest we do that with, uh, because we know that still they use it. They use, children use social yeah, media yeah. As, uh, when they're very little, even though legally they should be 13. So how can the school 
or the organization or the program or the project on air quality create or use the power of the social media? Can we go deeper into that? Yeah, definitely. That's a very, very interesting question because, um, you know, the last two Clean Air Day campaigns we've run, they've been run during the pandemic. So we haven't been able to get our big activities and have people together, really. It's all been done very much within the schools. And, uh, you know, I think everything, obviously, it's been a lot more stress and pressure for teachers, hasn't it? Um, and schools, because they've had to be COVID, COVID compliant and there's all sorts of restrictions about COVID now and this, their work has gone so much um, sky high now. It's crazy. Uh, but, you know, I think what you need to do is most schools, I don't know what the laws are in different countries, but I can only speak for our laws. And most schools in Scotland and in the UK have social media accounts on Twitter or Facebook. And somebody responsible in the school organises for images to be uh, made of pupils if they and they have to sign forms the parents have to sign forms to say that they agree to this so that's how it works you get uh, one of the teachers takes pictures of the pupils doing their clean air day activity um, and if they want to be in the picture they've, they've signed for that but if they don't they're not allowed in the picture so you have a situation where it's so everything's okay legally um, and they're taking part in clean air day as part of their work um, what we also have is we don't have really I wouldn't say we had pupils taking photographs themselves, young pupils, but their parents do. The parents take pictures of them walking to school for clean air day or doing an activity like cycling um, or holding a pledge card. Uh, so really parents are quite proactive as well. And they've got a lot of parents have got involved in this and they, they do a lot of work with that. So, but um, the other thing is worth bearing in mind is that obviously we've got COVID, but there are things in some schools, eco, we have eco teachers in Scotland, some eco teachers where, a teacher's assigned to deal with environmental issues as part of their job. You know, they're organising maybe the the garden or the, um, you know, community growing in the school. And it might be worth that's an opportunity to speak to an eco-teacher, find out who the eco-teacher is in the school. Um, and they, they can build a relationship with them. Um, and for example, we had, we were very lucky, the first clean air day we did in 2018, we got in touch, they had an eco teacher at a school in, in Inverness in the Highlands. And we organized with the council to drive an electric vehicle into the school playground, uh, and this and leaf, uh, and the children were allowed to sort of clamber over it and find out about the vehicle. And we did some pictures and then I went in and spoke to the school. Uh, I spoke to an assembly and told, told them about clean air day and, ask them what their parents do regarding air quality and how they drive and whether they are driven to school or they have to, to walk. And it really engages. And this school is every year taken part in Clean Air Day since. And the events they do get bigger and bigger. So it just shows you one thing has sparked interest. And it's just gone from one small thing to a really big part of our activities. Thank you, John. That's interesting. And that's very... Um, I think it's a good um, it's a good position, right? To 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 be at where you can actually um, not necessarily only trust in the educational system that sometimes when teachers are overworked and overburdened with a lot of work, then you can also use the whole community of lear the the whole learning community we are talking about in um, integrating parents into the equation, integrating not only the teachers, but also their, the students themselves in, into making these uh, campaigns, into participating in these campaigns. Um, I'm going to take a pause just to remind the participants of the community uh, that uh, they can type in questions in the chat while we have this conversation, and that uh, we will have, uh, in a few minutes, we will open the microphone for everybody to start uh, also bringing ideas into the conversation. So um, one last um, big situation that I would like to talk about uh, with you is, um, have there been any, or do you know about any challenges that you could share with us on how to overcome them into connecting with the educational uh, authorities or into connecting with the educational uh, institutions. How open are they if they are not open to these uh, programs or to bringing these, um, these um, experiences? 
Um, how did you manage to convince um, the school authorities to be part of this? Uh, and if they, if it has been a challenge, how did you overcome them? I'm not yeah, sure I mean, if it was clear. Yeah, that's not. It's really good. It's a really good question because um, what we find is every single school is different, and we don't we don't get every single school involved in Clean Air Day. Um, probably because maybe people are too busy the teachers are too busy or they have other priorities um, to address with their school they may maybe in a, a very poor area and that air quality is not a priority for them they have to ensure their ch children are, are being taught properly and they have a lot of difficulties maybe or there may be other issues they're just not prioritizing air quality or environment it's, it's just not part of what they do but it doesn't mean they're wrong um, I mean for example my own my own children go to a school and I wrote to the head teacher of this school and wanted her to take part in clean air day and I didn't even get a reply um, but I, I don't think she's wrong to do that but the thing is um, I know my daughter's school is encouraging people to cycle and they take part in activities for cycling and trying to cut car vehicle use so they just do it in a different way it doesn't mean maybe they just don't want to be involved in clean air day or a particular thing so I think it's important to realize that recognize that every school has priorities different priorities um, and it's not for us to prejudge people either um, you have to accept that some schools are not going to be involved and, and maybe move on to the next one. And then when they see that the other school nearby is doing really well, they maybe get involved. That's what sometimes happens with us. Uh, somebody will say, well, I wish we'd done that. I wish we'd done that. And uh, they end up getting involved. So yeah, I think you just have to keep pursuing it. Um, one thing I've found is the education departments in some of the places we work with, uh, they're quite good and they're really switched on. And they will actually send, I asked them, can you send me an, an email to all the schools in your area? Like they're about 100 or 200. So I, I can't do that because that's too many. And they will do that, uh, telling them about Clean Air Day. And if they want to get involved, to contact EP Scotland. And that's worked really well. Um, so if you've got somebody that's involved in the education department that could do that for you, just contacting people and being just not giving up, really. That's the main thing. So, um, you know, I think there's we've had experiences where schools have not taken part one year and then they've taken part the next and vice versa, there's been schools that have taken part and then it's not been what they want to do for the next year. So it's got to be, it's voluntary. That's the first thing you've got to realise. It's it's not something that people have paid extra to do. So really it's up to them. They've got to enjoy it as well and have a passion for it. So Yeah, I, I, I think then the position that we have to take when we are create, where we're trying to integrate the youth into air quality, um, air quality programs would be to create a program as beautiful as possible, as attractive as possible for them to join, not for us to follow, to, to yeah. not for us to invite them all the time, yeah. but sure. for them yeah. to want to join, right? Um, and, and probably um, how was, I mean, it would be important also to look for, at least at the beginning of a program like this, uh, ally schools, right? To schools yeah. that probably can help you piloting the program and, and checking, improving it and, and, and to include them in the process too. Well, yeah, that's I mean, great. Be, yeah, if you just start off with a few schools, I think you're doing really well, you know, four or five schools and just then the next year you can say, this is what we did um, and show them pictures and, and it builds from there, you know. But there's so many demands on, on schools now. There's so many demands, especially with COVID as well. Yeah. And, and also, um, there is, that's a point, an, inter an interesting point that we need to put on the table with this conversation and other conversations about clean air. Um, the relationship between the, our health and what we're doing to the, to the environment, right? In this case, COVID is something, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that happened because we're not taking care of the environment. So I think we are in, in the right moment to make people understand or to help people understand that there is a big relationship between our health and the environment that we take, what the, that we're not taking care of as it should. Yeah, absolutely. And there's opportunities um, to, we had a big increase in cycling and walking, um, like 200% increase almost in some areas of Scotland during the first lockdown in March last year. And we're trying to keep that going because people have suddenly realized that it's good to walk and cycle um, because the people are only allowed out once every day in, 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 in the UK during the real lockdown. And people cycled and walked for their exercise to get exercise. 
So it's people forget, remember that as well. And they, they want to, I'm sure we need to keep continuing this. What, what do students need in a city to, to, to cycle? What is the, the, what makes them want to cycle to school from their homes? What do they need? What do, does this need, city need to have or to be so, so we can, what conditions have to be created for that? Well, you need safe cycling areas. Um, and they've done a lot of that in Scotland. You need safe cycle paths that, where they don't share their cycling with vehicles um, because the parents won't let them otherwise cycle to school. I think that's the most important, single most important thing is to have safe cycling um, and segregated, you know, segregated um, cycling and uh, car lanes, which is hugely important. Um, and then obviously trying to encourage young people that can't afford a bike because there's a lot of poverty and um, trying to encourage young people to have their own bikes and maybe helping them, giving them financial support by a, a government um, to buy a bike because they're very expensive. And if you're middle yeah, class, somewhere. you can afford it, but if you're poor, it's not an option. So, Yeah, because I, I, I'm thinking about the, the, the bike lanes that we have in our city here in Mexico. And adults use them a lot, but not children. Um, And I think it's also a, it's a combination between having a safe city, uh, green infrastructure, and bike lanes, and all together, right? So it's a it's a whole it's a it's a big challenge, right? It's a big challenge because also, <clears throat> as you said before, there is a lot of a, a lot of air pollution is generated by the line of cars leaving their children their children yeah. in the school. So so changing that dynamic would be a very interesting challenge. So thank you very much, John, for, for this first part of the conversation. And now I'm inviting everybody else to open their mic cameras and microphones if they, if they wish to um, give us a comment, uh, ask, ask more questions about this topic and, and supporting us in, in, in creating a, a deeper conversation. Anyone? wants to open their microphone and share something. Anyone? Yes, Suva Darcini, welcome. You can open your microphone. Yeah. Hi, Jesus. How are you? Fine. Hi. Thank you. Hi, John. Hello, uh, pleased to meet you. Uh, I'm Subodar Sini. I'm from India. I am working in State Pollution Control Board in Odisha State, and I am environmental engineer. And uh, you very beautifully explained the many points, which will help me personally, because in my organization, I organize many public awareness program uh, regarding air pollution, uh, particularly among school children and college children. So the things you have pointed out uh, definitely will help me. Mm, uh, like the things you said, uh, doing paintings. Uh, we also organize different painting competitions, but generally what we do, uh, we after selecting the winners, we discard the other paintings or uh, many things. But one idea now, just now I got that, uh, um, why will giving, uh, we will give priority only the winners, so, but uh, about the other uh, paintings, we could uh, bind them or print them or make booklets like yeah. uh, this and circulate among the schools that, uh, so that it will also create awareness. Because by seeing these paintings, other uh, kids and students will get encouragement also. Uh, that uh, idea just came, came into my mind just now. Uh, I will definitely implement it in my organization. And uh, the thing, uh, uh, you may take it as a comment or a little bit of question that, uh, which always comes to my, my mind, not it is the first time. But I believe that uh, if I am not doing something, Uh, and what I am not following, if I am saying to my saying to so to my friend or colleague, it may be my family member. In in this case, uh, presently we can take the students or kids uh, that you do this thing like uh, switch off the lights when it is not required, switch off the ACs or any electronic or electrical equipment, mm -hmm. or use public transport in place of uh, using your uh, car or own bikes. Uh, if I am not doing it, 
just like example uh, i will not prefer to go uh, any place maybe my office or any place uh, i will prefer my personal vehicle uh, and uh, in place of uh, public transportation uh, i think that it will give me more prestige or more uh, good look to the society my neighbors or friends that's why i i'll prefer uh, personal vehicle whatever i will do my kids will see it and uh, they will follow it Uh, rather than uh, saying something, uh, they will not accept it. They will follow what I will do. Similar thing will happen in our so- society also. If we, in the society something is absent, uh, it may be due to um, our uh, rule regulation or government activities or something uh, has not been implemented by government or something has not been done by certain organization. Uh, just like I said. Uh, uh one example suppose i will uh, in the awareness program i will say that you you cycle to the kids the students uh, but at the same time i personally will not follow it i will ask the kids and students that you should do plantation but kids are smart and, and uh, social media is very active and uh, now the world is very small for everyone so they see industrialization mining everything they also in the study books they read it and they frequently uh, read about deforestation and they keep on asking if government is doing deforestation and you are asking us to the small kids to do plantation i'm just putting my queries don't take it otherwise okay and uh, how at that places when the kids ask you in the schools and colleges you you do this type of programs how you will handle the, those situations because uh, uh, one thing i just as, as i told it is my personal opinion uh, practically also i have faced this situation in one of my public awareness program in a school uh, one uh, one student asked me directly uh, my presentation was on air pollution there are uh, we are uh, a core group from health department uh educational institutes from my side for environment uh, i made a presentation on air pollution that student asked me that uh, he asked me certain um, queries regarding government implementation which we, i should not tell here uh, that um, madam these these things are happening in our society or in, in in our district in our area and government is not doing and in this uh, forum uh, you have made a very good presentation uh, asked her to do the, the, these things and these things should be done to control air pollution in our level in our day to day activity then what about those things which you government people are not doing and wh- which problems we are facing and i realized that really it, the question was uh, genuine but uh, somehow how we manage that situation because <laughs> we have to handle it we have to tackle it and somehow i convinced that that uh, student but internally i was not satisfied so so uh, my question is to john that you are a john, journalist you uh, were field have in journalism you, you might have uh, interacted many people you, you have many exposure so what you your suggestion or what you think that th- this thing should be done because we are uh, in upper age and kids are in lower age so like a dictatorship we yes we are doing awareness because uh, they are our next generation they should know many things they should be aware they should know air pollution they should learn good things but when uh, the behavioral attitude is upset in ourselves oh, among our grown ups uh, in our government systems so how can we educate those kids and those students the actually this is my basic question i um, for that reason i said so many things so that you understand my point of view uh, right. hope yeah. you you can give, give a little bit idea or answer to my question yeah that's right well um i think it's very difficult to you know some of the questions we get asked um in schools is it's really challenging from very young pupils and they challenge us uh, to change our behaviors um and you know we had one school i went to see the pupils were talking about why their parents they sit in their car with the engine on and 
they never really asked them to challenge. They've never challenged their parents about this because I asked how many parents sit in the car with their engine on, switched on, so their missions are coming out. And they, they, a lot of pupils put their hands up. And they meant, meant they went away and thought about what, uh, you know, their parents' activities were and, and how they were committing pollution without realising. But before, they'd never had to think about this. Um, and the other thing is, I think you're right, you know, a lot of people are now asking, well, I'm doing my bit. I'm, I'm maybe buying an electric car or... Uh, I'm cycling or walking, but what is the government doing and what, what are they doing to stop other people from polluting the environment or taking action? So this is one of the things that's becoming quite, quite, quite a big issue that I think as people make decisions themselves to um, improve air quality and, and improve the environment, they want to see government action as well. And, you know, we've out, we outline what the government is doing in Scotland. We have low emission zones, for example, where you won't be able to bring a diesel or petrol vehicle into a city centre in Scotland. Um, this is coming in in a few years. So that's a really big thing for us to sell. You've got to have something to sell as part of the campaign. Otherwise, people won't change their attitudes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is quite challenging. And some of the questions you get from the young people's in primary, really young people's about five years old. It's amazing or six years old. And it's really some of the questions are tougher than any question I get from an adult. You know, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So you have to answer these questions as fully as you can. Um, but yeah, it's. It, I think what you're doing sounds like amazing with um, artwork, and I would encourage you to do that because it's it's simple and it's cost effective, and it just requires imagination. Um, we did a, a really brilliant um, coloring book, a coloring in book for children, and we sent this to all the schools that were involved this year. And if I can get you a copy, I'll try and send you a copy. That's great. Thank you very much, Silva Darcini, for the question. And thank you very much, John, for that response. Um, Monica, I think you have a question too. Go on. Yeah, well, actually, it's not exactly a question, but uh, it's more uh, a comment because I was, when, when you, Jan, you were uh, sharing your experiences at how you are working with the students, students I was reminding my childhood <laughs> and how we we were a uh, familiar of or close to the science. So in my ch childhood, it wasn't so um, close to this kind of of items or topics in my, my my school. I was studying in a public school, but I remember I do remember. When in Guadalajara, in my city, we start with this campaign to uh, promoting save the water and do not waste water and do not <laughs> swipe the the, uh, the streets with water and everything. Because in, in the 80s, it was a lot of uh, waste of water. No, So they start with this big campaign and the office of the system water on the city were uh, having this tour of uh, of conversations with with us with the children just to because of course we are like the key of this change just to stay saying the the parents please don't do that and change this this action so in that case i was thinking uh, in the projects that our this, this city the buna buvanespar and leon they having and how they can uh, connect with the, or create a, a collaboration with the, with the institution who is taking charge of the education in, well, in the case in Mexico, is the, secret, uh, the educa public education secretary, how they can create a collaboration to promote or to show this, this project and they can start to um, have these the children as allies in the in the promotion of their own uh, project, but also to uh, provide more information about the, how, what is the importance of to have a cleaner, how it is the importance to uh, not using a car, is preferring walking or is preferring using the bike. So this kind of uh, new ways of mobility in, in the cities, no, that could be helpful also to the project and in so on uh, in the future for other uh, changes changes in the in the city so 
maybe maybe uh, well you share already a lot of experiences that uh, you have been uh, doing in your work work but do you have this kind of uh, 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 another like uh, recommendation or kind of tip that that the public administrations they can uh, uh, they can implement in the terms of of uh, coordinating uh, yeah the cooperation interinstitutional just a little bit uh, like uh, how to work directly with these uh, educational institutions i don't know if i was quite yeah, clear yeah, but yeah i mean um I, we work with the count um, local councils we have a councils in cities as well um in, in scotland and they they are responsible for the the education sector so they are very keen to for us to get involved and going to schools. And um, we find that the enthusiasm, particularly in the cities where um, there is real concern in the cities about air quality um, and environment, and a lot of awareness raising um, among pupils and students, um, it's very, very high. Um, sometimes in more, more quiet, we live in, obviously Scotland is very rural. There is maybe not so much interest, but there is a lot of raised awareness. And I think uh, we've got people like Greta Thunberg to thank for that, that young people are a lot more aware and, and schools want to take part in activities. Um, and, um, you know, just obviously from the previous question, but um, as well, uh, it does clean air day and, and we don't need to stick to one particular subject. Air quality um, can be part of the wider environment, environmental agenda. Um, we had pledge cards, our pledge cards, um, at a hospital, we had the pledge cards event at a hospital and people were talking about not just driving less and taking the bikes, but they were talking about boiling less water in the kettle when they make a cup of tea or a coffee to, to try and improve the environment and to try and use less electricity. Um, and to be, and somebody even said uh, two, two meat free days a week they would do, you know, to cut down on uh, meat. So, it, you know, it's fed into a lot of the wider um, agenda, environmental agenda. And it's, I think all local authorities and councils we're involved in want to do far more. Um, in, in Scotland, uh, over the last few years, um, a lot of areas have um, announced climate emergencies where we live. And this uh, means that they have to take action to cut emissions, cut their own emissions and encourage people to change the way they travel and their behaviour as well, such as wood burning, wood burning stoves and, and uh, domestic burning, which is a big issue for air pollution in some areas in some countries as well. So we, we get a lot of support and, you know, it, they really feed into it. Thank you. That makes me think, um, just to complement this question, sorry, Emma. Uh, that makes me think about the possibilities that we have, for example, here in Mexico. I'm not sure if there is a similar system in India, but here in Mexico, we have a, a system about the social and environmental responsible companies. It's like a seal. And uh, probably these kind of campaigns can um, invite these uh, companies to create also similar campaigns regarding their their um, emissions and how they are cutting in and integrating a part of, an educational part of it into the into these uh, into the program or the, they can even be collaborative programs, right? Um, is there anything like that in the UK, like social? or responsible uh, um, enterprise or companies? Yeah, program? Um, we, there's a, a lot of small companies now that are um, socially responsible and, and they put money, the money they make goes back into uh, sustainability and, and even encouraging people, employment for you, you know people that might not be able to get a job or have difficulty finding a job. So there's a really good thing uh, called Social Bite in Edinburgh. Um, it's mm -hmm. a cafe. And it's become a huge thing and it's it's been set up as a sort of philanthropic venture. Uh, and actually, you know, they got, uh, I think George Clooney came along to buy a coffee at this coffee shop. It's a coffee shop in Edinburgh. George Clooney came along, <laughs> you know, he did, he did a, it was like they could not get into there because the crowds in Edinburgh when they knew George Clooney was coming along were massive. But yeah, it's, it's attracting a lot of publicity in, in um, this country and it's really just sustainability. And a lot of organizations now are setting up, setting up like that. They, they want to be sustainable. They're not interested in making big profits. And um, you'll find that there's more and more small things, especially in rural areas as well. You know, there could be bike hubs. You get bike hubs and, and cycle hire where they're just trying to give people low jobs and, and 
uh, feeds into the environmental agenda and they're doing everything in a sustainable way. So it's really fantastic. I think that's got to be encouraged. You know, that's the market taking care of itself, that people are attracted to organizations like this and it, it gains them customers as well. That would be also a way to to engage the community and other companies in, in uh, for example, in the projects that Mexico and India want to create for uh, cleaner zones. Yeah. Integrating the companies around the cleaner zones or in the cleaner zones through these recognition programs that they are working for sustainability, that would be an option to, I mean, it just came up like, a, that would be another strategy to, to, to engage them. Um, I would like to also have a last invitation for probably someone from Mexico or someone else in the audience to make a question or, or give us a comment. Because we're getting close to the end. Emma, you had a question? Yes. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Um, so one is that when you mentioned that you were able to get some funding to create materials for the schools and distribute them, um, I was wondering how, um, how an organization can, can get that kind of funding. And then the other is that um, as we were talking about... Um, how certain schools will have more time and more availability to take on these programs, whereas the most overburdened schools or the schools in the poorest zones uh, might not be able to take on this extra burden. Um, although it would still be very important for these children to get access to this kind of information and this kind of activity. So um, do you have a suggestion of an alternative way to approach those schools or uh, an alternative way to approach children of particularly vulnerable communities? Well, yeah, I mean, you need to sort of, I'll take the second question first. I think you need to um, do things in a really responsible way. And it is important that we reach out and try and get schools in, in poor areas involved because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the children from the most deprived parts of society are often the most affected by air pollution, even, even though they might not have access to a vehicle. You know, they are not the ones that are driving around because they don't have a, an access to their vehicle. Very often they, they have to walk and use the public transport, but they have been exposed to air pollution because they live in a city centre. So it is hugely important to reach out to the city centres. And one of the, uh, that was one of the aims of Clean Air Day, really, to, to try and get you know, city centre schools where there are poor areas of air quality and, and a lot of poverty as well. So uh, reaching out to them, you just need to set out the facts and, and try and reach out in a way that's responsible, explaining, you know, that there's a lot of unfairness and, and inequity around um, air quality and air pollution and that they can play their part in raising awareness of this. And obviously it's up to other people as well, but if they're involved, it's, it's huge if you've got them involved because they can then campaign and they can go to see politicians and they can talk with real from the heart about what their experiences are um, of air pollution in, in city centres and how they really are not responsible for it. And this is the big problem, uh, that they're not responsible for, for the air pollution they're suffering. Um, just in terms of the funding, um, we were fortunate we had a good relationship with the Scottish Government, um, which, and, and they, had a, they have a cleaner air for Scotland strategy. So they are really uh, committed to tackling air, air pollution in Scotland and improving the air quality. Um, and they decided, the Scottish Government decided that Clean Air Day would be part of their Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy, which is a four or five year strategy and it's going to continue. Uh, so that, that was a decision the government made. But we obviously put across our, our side and why we wanted to do it this year. And every year we have to renew the contract. But without their funding, I don't think we could do what we, did, we do. Um, to be honest, we couldn't have resources online resources we couldn't have the social media reach and we wouldn't have be able to afford to go to different places because that costs money uh so we you need to get um, a government on board and it's in their interest it's in, in every government's interest to be involved in improving air quality because they're responsible to the voters and, and the, it's becoming more of an important issue as well so if you can get a good contact in the government i would just really build relationships with the government or local government and see if you can get some small funding to start with and then build it from there. But we've been really supported, so we're lucky. Thank you very much, John. Thank Fortunately, 
the audience and and the particip the members of the Rebel Cities community are all government offices. So, so and yeah. I I expect a lot of support from them. And this this we have we have come to the end because of the time. Uh, we have come to the end of this conversation. We actually enjoyed um, your your stories, the experience that you've had with this, and we can't thank you enough uh, for this. Um, because it, I think it's been very um, valuable for, for all of us in, in the community of practice to understand the possibilities that we have through education, through empowering the youth to become aware and actually take action for air quality. That would be, that, that's a very powerful way of uh, tackling this, this issue of air quality improvement. So we can't thank you enough, John. Uh, but we have reached the end and thank you very much for uh, sharing with us these experiences and we will be um, sharing more content about this for the, for the, um, through the community of practice and also we will send you the, the, these two so you can have it. Thank you very much everybody thank also uh, from Mexico and India for joining and I hope you had enjoyed this conversation. Have a great, great day, afternoon and night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.